Y'all, I am on high fucking alert because my husband killed a big ass spider in this room the other day. I'm just waiting for its little friends to come out. What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, Welcome. My name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if you find true crime captivating like I do and you also really enjoy makeup, I'd say subscribe because that's kind of the whole shtick around here. You could also like this video if you want, but I mean, it's up to you. It's super helpful. So if you wanna, I'd really appreciate it, but do what you will. But if you're not into this whole thing, then I apologize for the interruption to your content consumption. And if you'd still like to hear the story without the makeup, then feel free to head down to the description box where out of the kindness of my heart, I've taken the time to list some other creators that have covered today's story in a way that perhaps you will enjoy more. And I believe that covers all of the obligatory housekeeping items. So how about we go ahead and get into today's case. Okay, so today's case, um, it's something. The crime itself took place almost 25 years ago, but the, I guess if you want to call it a resolution, took place uh, Friday, as in like three days ago, Friday. So yeah, today's case spans over the course of 25 years. A quarter of a century it took to, I guess, give closure to a seemingly very obvious case. And I am very interested to hear your guys' opinions. Julie Carol Griffin was born on February 26th, 1958 in Kenosha, Wisconsin to her parents, Raymond and June. Ray was the sole breadwinner of the family, working as a designer and drafter at American Motors Company, while June stayed home with their five children. Julie was the second oldest out of her siblings, and she was also the only girl surrounded by four brothers. So I just know that that house was chaos because boys are chaos. <laughs> so four boys is chaos to the fourth power. <laughs> they say you never use algebra after school. Now, I know I just said that Julie was the second oldest sibling in the family, but she was actually the third child born to Ray and June. Sadly, before Julie was born, her older brother Richie had died in a tragic accident just before his fifth birthday. So even though Julie technically had five brothers, she only grew up knowing four of them. Her older brother, Larry, and her younger brothers, Michael, Paul, and Patrick. And I have no knowledge of the specifics of how Richie died. I have seen some speculation, but without being able to confirm that speculative story with 100% certainty, I don't feel comfortable relaying it here. But whatever happened, whatever the circumstances, I'm sure that it was extremely difficult for the Griffins. And I'm sure that it made them hold their five surviving children that much closer. And it certainly does seem like the family was incredibly close, despite the children having age variations of up to, I think it was like 15 years between some of them. But that didn't matter. They were still incredibly close knit. They frequently went ice skating and roller skating together. They love spending time outside and seemingly above all else, they loved camping. In fact, they loved camping so much that when the opportunity presented itself, Ray purchased an old like out of commission school bus he gutted it, he renovated it, and he turned it into a fully functioning RV. And based on some of the things that I've heard some of Julie's brothers say, Ray just sounds like he was such an awesome dad. He seemed like he really wanted his children to have a fun upbringing and to have a ton of amazing childhood memories to look back on. And he worked his ass off to make the money that he needed to provide those memories and those experiences for his kids. And again, based on the words of one of Julie's brothers, it seems like that really meant a lot to the children and like it had a very lasting impact on them. Ray and June raised their children with strong Christian morals. They made sure that they always attended church and Sunday school and they were all baptized and later confirmed. Faith was very important to the Griffin family and Julie carried those values and that respect for God throughout her entire life. Unfortunately though, it wasn't 
all sunshine and butterflies for the Griffins because for most of her life, Julie's mother June struggled with a dependence on alcohol. And because this obviously interfered with her ability to run the household, Julie oftentimes found herself taking on the like motherly role to her younger brothers. And even though I'm sure this was difficult for Julie as it would be for any child, she definitely did not let this pressure completely take her over. She still managed to find time to develop a love for music. She enjoyed singing as well as playing instruments. From an early age, she learned to play the accordion. And later she went on to play the violin in her school's orchestra. Julie was also a model student. She always maintained excellent grades and consistently found herself on the honor roll all throughout middle and high school. She had a ton of friends and even though she was quiet, she was definitely the happiest when she was around people. And people loved being around Julie. She was warm and kind and caring and sincere. And according to her brother, she genuinely saw the best in people and she wanted nothing more than to enrich the lives of those who knew her. And it seems like she did just that. Julie was gentle and carefree and easygoing, and those closest to her seem to truly believe that they're better people now for having ever known her. Julie graduated Tremper High School in Kenosha in 1976 before enrolling in the University of Wisconsin Parkside's nursing program. And I think that this just truly speaks to how caring and selfless Julie really was because she had already spent such a huge portion of her life caring for others and she didn't resent it, even though she'd been fairly young when she'd taken those responsibilities on. Conversely, she loved it so much that she had wanted to make it her entire life's work. But it's no secret that college ain't cheap, at least in America, where we hold, I believe, the second highest average student loan debt. So while in college, to mitigate those expenses, Julie began working at a local Sears. And it was while working at this job that Julie Griffin met a young man named Mark Jensen. Just like Julie, Mark Daniel Jensen had been born and raised in Kenosha. He was born in October of 1959 to his parents, Dan and Florence Jensen. And as far as I can find, he seems like he had a fairly happy childhood. Dan had a very successful and lucrative career in finance. So the Jensen family was always very well taken care of. Mark was a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout throughout his youth before he too graduated from Tremper High School in 1976, just like Julie had. And just like Julie, following graduation, Mark had also enrolled in college at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. And just like Julie, Mark had also gotten a job at Sears in an effort to earn money to go towards his college expenses. Honestly, the amount of stuff that they had in common was pretty crazy. And when the two of them finally crossed paths, they were drawn to each other instantly. And it makes sense. Like I said, they had a ton of stuff in common. They were both hardworking, young, attractive people with similar goals and aspirations for their lives. And as they got to know each other while working at Sears, they eventually started dating. And from there, the two of them were pretty much inseparable. So much so that when Julie transferred from the University of Wisconsin Parkside two hours away to the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh to work towards her BSN, Mark chose to also transfer schools and to move with her. He started a small house painting business, which he employed nine other students at, and for a while he painted houses to support he and Julie. It was about halfway through her third year of college when Julie started to second guess what she might want to do with her life, which is a hesitation I can relate to on a spiritual level. I was never able to decide on something that I wanted to do badly enough that I was willing to put myself into massive debt for. So I didn't. And despite being fairly close to obtaining her degree, Julie just didn't feel as if she was on the right path. So she made the difficult decision to forego her nursing career and to drop out of college. But even so, it truly seemed as though everything was going to be okay. Mark graduated with flying colors. He got a job working as a stockbroker. And in 1984, he and Julie officially tied the knot. They settled down in the Carroll Beach neighborhood of Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, where in 1990, they welcomed their first son, David. From the outside looking in, it seemed as though the Jensen's were living the typical 
all-American dream. They had a wonderful marriage. They had a new baby. They had a beautiful house. People thought their lives were perfect. But if there's anything we've learned from being true crime aficionados, it's that if from the outside looking in, your life looked perfect, or if your smile lights up a room, chances are you are not long for this world. Because things are never as picturesque as they appear to others, at least not in the stories that end up on this channel. And the Jensen's lives were no exception because behind closed doors, things were kind of sort of falling apart at the seams. Julie suffered from a pretty serious bout of postpartum depression following David's birth. And she really resented being home alone all the time, taking care of the baby while Mark continued living his life basically as if he was single. He go to work all day. And then instead of coming home to his family in the evenings, allegedly, more often than not, he'd go out drinking and partying with his co-workers, which left Julie feeling as though she was being spread incredibly thin. Because on top of taking care of David all day, Mark also expected Julie to keep a tidy home, to provide homemade meals, and to basically worship the ground that he walked on. He expected so much for himself from Julie that supposedly he was even kind of resentful of how much love and attention she showed their son. Eventually, Julie decided to pick up a part-time job working as a sales assistant at a brokerage firm, which I assume she did more for mental health reasons than anything, because from my understanding, they didn't necessarily need the money. But it does seem like she would have benefited from some time out of the house. Because at this point, she and Mark's relationship had really begun to deteriorate. On top of all the festering feelings of resentment they seem to have towards one another, Mark had also started traveling a lot for work. And this left Julie feeling even more disconnected from him than she'd already been feeling following the birth of their son. It was getting to a point where Julie was incredibly unhappy in her marriage. And eventually she actually started confiding in some of her coworkers about this. And one of those coworkers happened to be a man named Perry Tarika. Initially, Perry and Julie had bonded over being parents and sharing like similar worldly views. But as their friendship progressed, Julie started speaking more and more freely to Perry about her floundering relationship. Perry at the time just so happened to be going through his own divorce, so he was certainly no stranger to relationship woes. And it appears that this fact really bonded the two of them together. They started spending more and more time together in and out of work. And over time, they started to develop at the very least a physical attraction and feelings of lust. For one another. Feelings that ultimately came to a head one weekend in 1991 when Mark went out of town on one of his business trips. Home alone, house to herself, and fed up with she and Mark's rapidly deteriorating marriage, Julie decided to invite Perry over to she and Mark's home for dinner. And I have no idea how they planned for the evening to play out or how much of what ended up happening they had actually anticipated. But somehow dinner managed to parlay itself into Julie and Perry spending a hot, steamy couple of days together. Whoopsies. Now, obviously this doesn't necessarily paint Julie in the best light, but from what I could gather, she was almost instantly filled with regret that she had taken things with Perry as far as she had. She actually ended up quitting her job at the company they'd both worked for within days of their rendezvous. And the only other time that she really even spoke to Perry following their weekend together was to explicitly ask him to never speak to anyone about what had happened between them. And she also asked him to never contact her again. According to Perry, the weekend that he and Julie had spent together made her realize for whatever reason that she wanted to stick it out and try and make things work with Mark. I assume for the sake of their son, but I don't know. I do know though that eventually when Mark did find out about Julie's affair, things between the two of them got worse than they had 
ever been. Understandably, the discovery of infidelity within the marriage created quite a rift between Mr. and Mrs. Jensen. And eventually, when Julie felt like she just couldn't take it anymore, in June of 1991, she finally threw in the towel and she filed for divorce. She felt like it would be a happier and healthier setup for her and Mark to divorce and serve simply as co-parents to David. Mark, however, vehemently disagreed. He had absolutely no interest in going through with the divorce. And actually he told Julie that if she tried to move forward with the dissolution of their marriage, that he would make sure that she never saw her son again. And these threats were incredibly effective. Julie loved her son more than anything in the world. And if it came down to choosing between her romantic happiness or her relationship with him, well, there was no question. She would sacrifice her own happiness every time. So she withdrew her divorce petition, effectively conceding to her husband, therefore proving to him that David could easily be used as a bargaining chip to manipulate Julie into compliance anytime he wanted. And in my opinion, that is so incredibly sick. Using your child as a pawn in your manipulative game of marital chess, that's gross. I have never in my life understood people who do things like this. Like, why would you want to force someone to be with you that you know doesn't want to be with you? My personal opinion is that he felt like he could easily control Julie and that he just wasn't willing to give up everything that she did for him. She did the cooking, she did the cleaning, she took care of David, she basically kept that household running. She did so much for Mark that their families actually had a running joke that Mark was lucky to have Julie to take care of him because he couldn't even make a simple pasta or macaroni and cheese or I don't know. They frequently teased Mark that he was incapable of preparing even the most fundamental like basic ass food. And while I'm sure the joke was all in good fun, I don't think that it was baseless. I think that Mark liked having Julie to take care of whatever he needed. That way he could go out and build up his career and he basically got to do whatever he wanted. Julie and Mark did start attending couples counseling to try and repair some of the damage that Julie's affair seemed to have done to their marriage. But no matter how hard they tried to move past it, they just couldn't. It seemed like it was always gonna be this like ominous dark cloud looming over them. And then the harassment began. Shortly after Julie withdrew her divorce petition and she and Mark started counseling, inexplicably horrifying reminders of what she'd done started popping up everywhere in their lives. And when I say everywhere, I mean, everywhere. One day, out of the blue, the Jensen's started finding very graphic and very sexually explicit photos all over their property. They were plastered to their cars, their front door, their mailbox, the shed in their backyard. Sometimes they even found them inside their house. It was basically the letter scene in Sorcerer's Stone, but instead of Hogwarts acceptance letters for the Jensen's, it was raining it was a really, really scary time for Julie. And even though they definitely weren't, Julie, for some reason, was convinced that these photos were actually of her. She thought that they were pictures that someone had managed to take of her and that that someone was essentially trying to drive her crazy with guilt by ensuring that she would never forget what she'd done. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, on top of being taunted by these horrible pictures on a pretty regular basis, Julie also started receiving what she interpreted to be harassing phone calls. To the best of my knowledge, these calls were either just silence or hangups, but regardless of the subject matter, these phone calls were distressing enough to Julie that she decided she needed to reach out to the Pleasant Prairie Police Department and make a formal report to document what she'd been experiencing. Julie's first documented call reporting this harassment is recorded as having taken place on August 13th, 1991. And despite like a fairly concerted effort to figure all of this out, the harassment continued for years, six to be exact. And it was not for a lack of trying, they tried. One of the first things they did was look into Perry, cause duh, but he was easily ruled out given that he'd actually gotten a new job and moved to a completely different state by this point. And outside of Julie's ex-lover, she and the police didn't really have any idea 
of who might want to mercilessly torment her to this extent. Over the years, they tried tapping the Jensen's phone. Julie made sure to keep detailed logs of everything that she experienced. She kept in constant contact with the police department, making sure to report anything and everything to them that she thought might be relevant. But no matter who tried what, they never seemed to make any headway in determining who could possibly be responsible for Julie's harassment. Actually, ironically, every time they'd try and tap the phones, the calls would miraculously just stop. As if whomever was making said calls maybe knew that the lines were being tapped and that their calls might be traced. It's weird, right? Well, eventually everyone kind of started to feel like they were banging their head against a wall given the lack of progress being made. And ultimately this led to the Jensen's contracting out the services of a former police officer turned private detective, one Mr. David Ellis. And Mr. Ellis, following a review of the case and some preliminary surveillance, came to the conclusion that I hope you've all come to by now. And that is that maybe, potentially, allegedly, maybe Mark could have been leaving these photos for Julie to find, maybe? Is that what you were thinking? Well, Mr. Ellis sure was, and he brought this theory to Julie, and he voiced his concerns to her that perhaps Mark was responsible for the incessant harassment she'd been experiencing, and that perhaps it was his way of shaming her for what she'd done. But understandably, Julie did not want to hear this. I mean, she is married to this man. He's supposed to be her safe place, her, her person. It's 1996 at this point. They've been together for like 13 years, give or take. They've got kids together. Oh yeah, they had another kid, another son. They named him Douglas. He was born in like, I think 95. So I can totally 100% understand why Julie would be reluctant to believe that the man she was raising her children with this man that she was sleeping next to every night, that he could also be the person responsible for relentlessly tormenting her for the last six years. It had to have been a horrifying thought to have to acknowledge. However, in my opinion, I don't really think that Mr. Ellis was telling Julie anything that she hadn't already thought of. I'd be willing to bet that she had her own suspicions all along that Mark was the one leaving the photos and making the phone calls. I just think that she was hoping that somehow either the police or Mr. Ellis or some combination of the two would somehow manage to find out that it was in fact someone else. I think she was desperately hoping that they'd be able to prove to her that her suspicions were wrong and that her husband wasn't a completely unhinged totally deranged maniac. But obviously they were never able to conclusively prove one way or another who was responsible for the hell on earth that Julie endured over the course of those six years. But despite being put through the ringer, Julie managed to remain completely and totally fully dedicated to her family. She lovingly referred to them as her three Ds, Daddy, David, and Douglas. She even had a custom vanity license plate made for her car that was dedicated to her boys. Come to think of it, she was like way ahead of the game because those little like stick figure car families, I don't think those became popular until like the mid 2000s. But Julie was plastering her family all over her car to the best of her ability way before that. An innovator, if you will. Truly though, she was very involved with her boys and she loved them more than I could even begin to convey to you here. There was nothing that she wasn't willing to do for those kids. And that included volunteering as a room parent in David's third grade class every single Wednesday. At the meet the teacher, like open house thing they'd had for that school year, Julie eagerly turned in her volunteer form to David's teacher, Teresa DeFaggio. And when she did, the two of them got to talking and Julie started telling Miss DeFaggio how she would love to help with either arts or crafts, that she could help grade papers. Basically, whatever she needed, Julie was willing and happy to help with. That is until Miss DeFaggio asked Julie if she would be able to help out in the computer lab. And hearing this, whoo, 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 Julie was just 
aghast. Because remember, we're talking 1998. Computers were not a part of everyday life to people like they are now. At that time, I think like less than half of all families had a computer in their house and even fewer had internet access. And while the Jensen's did happen to have a computer at home with internet access, it was utilized from my understanding almost exclusively by Mark. Now, that's not to say that no one else in the family ever looked at the computer, but the way that I've heard it described, it was primarily Mark's computer, which was located in Mark's little office den, like, man cave thing. According to Ms. DeFazio, Julie told her that she couldn't even turn a computer on. She told her that, sure, if you sat her down in front of one of the typing programs, she could probably type something, albeit slowly, but she certainly didn't feel as though she had the knowledge to help teach the children anything about computers. So instead, Julie would come in for about two hours every Wednesday morning. She would listen to the children as they read. She would help them with their math. She'd help Mr. Fazio with other miscellaneous tasks. From Mr. Fazio's testimony, it seems like she and Julie got along really well. Like they actually started to grow quite close during the time that Julie spent helping out in her class. Mr. Fazio also had two sons. Granted, they were a lot older than David and Douglas, but nevertheless, she and Julie's conversations started out just kind of bonding over being boy moms. But as the two of them got to know each other more and more and Julie grew to trust Miss DeFaggio, she started confiding in her more and more. It started with her nonchalantly mentioning that at one point she and Mark had been in marriage counseling. Then eventually she very self-consciously admitted to Miss DeFaggio why they'd been in marriage counseling, that regretfully she had had an affair. And then when she was really comfortable, she confided in Miss DeFaggio that ever since said affair, Mark had not really been treating her very well. Allegedly, he'd been overbearing and untrusting, which, to play devil's advocate, I can understand to a certain degree. However, I do think that if your partner is unfaithful and you choose to stay with them, or I guess in this case, basically blackmail them to stay with you, you have to be willing to forgive and to work to build that trust back up. Because if you're just never going to let it go and you're never going to trust them again, what the hell is the point of staying together? That just sounds like an absolute nightmare for everyone involved. But it wasn't just his lack of trust in her that was starting to upset Julie. He'd also become increasingly critical of her and her ability to parent their sons. And if you're thinking what I was admittedly thinking while researching this part of the case. Yeah, it's kind of weird to think of a parent confiding all of these things to their kid's teacher. But I think more than anything, that shows how desperate Julie felt to get all of these things off of her chest. And Ms. DeFaggio even testified that she always made a point to encourage open communication between she and her students' parents. That she always wanted them to feel comfortable talking to her about anything. With that said, though, I don't think that she could have ever, 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 not in one trillion years ever, have imagined what Julie confided in her next. It was Julie's first Wednesday back volunteering after Thanksgiving when mid-conversation, Julie blurted out to Ms. DeFazio that she thought that her husband might be planning to kill her. Now, obviously, this one really blew Ms. DeFaggio's hair back. I mean, that is a hell of a concern, which is exactly what she said to Julie in response to this revelation. She then asked her why on earth she would possibly think that. And so Julie went on to explain to her that every time Mark was on his computer, he would act very, like, coy and secretive and that because of this she'd actually gone snooping in his den and when she did this she'd happened upon some distressing handwritten notes near his computer that really upped her concern which we're not going to get into that right this second but don't worry because it it's going to come right back around like a boomerang to the teeth but first why don't we take a moment to talk about what exactly mark jensen had been up to all this time. Fucking creeping. 
That's what. Yeah. Mr. Where are you going? What are you doing? Who's going to be there? How dare you cheat on me? Yeah. He'd been out there for damn near three months at this point, sticking it to his boss's assistant. Mark had met Kelly Labonte on a business trip he'd taken to St. Louis. And after weeks of exchanging tawdry emails back and forth, eventually he and Kelly began to engage in the sex. And apparently they were pretty fucking brazen about it. Here Mark was obviously married and Kelly was engaged to be married, but that didn't stop them from being flamboyantly flirtatious in front of their other coworkers. They seemed to always be together. You rarely saw one without the other. And on top of that, one of their coworkers claimed that they always seemed to be closing doors that didn't really have a valid reason to be closed, if you catch my drift. I mean, we've all had these coworkers. We've all seen this kind of behavior. They think they're being sly and inconspicuous. They ain't. And what's really crazy is y'all Kelly still went ahead with her wedding, all while cheating on her fiance slash new husband with Mark. Fucking great value, Kevin Bacon. She literally pranced down the aisle, said I do, and then 11 minutes later, she turned around and started telling Mark how it made her sick to her stomach when her husband would tell her that he loves her. Like, I don't, how, what, what? I've been with my husband for going on 10 years and it still makes me smile and get all giddy when he tells me that he loves me. So it is seriously so sad to think that this is the stuff that she was saying about her husband behind his back. I mean, I don't personally know the guy, but barring any character flaws that he may have that are obviously unbeknownst to me, I feel bad for him. I cannot even begin to imagine how horrible and how devastating it must have been for him to find out all of this. Just why would you go through with the wedding? Like it just, it frustrates me so much. But <laughs> anyways, um, fast forward to October, 1998. A wee little Jessica is gearing up for her sixth birthday. The US House of Representatives votes to begin impeachment hearings against President Clinton. And Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte are daydreaming about running away together. They're just so in love that they want to disappear together, pick up, go off the grid and live happily ever after. There was, of course, just one teeny, tiny problem with this plan. And that problem was their current respective spouses. Ugh. So Kelly decides to give she and Mark an ultimatum of sorts, which is obviously how all healthy and successful relationships begin. Adultery and ultimatums. <laughs> <laughs> what a dream. Seriously though, Kelly decides that enough is enough. They can't keep living in limbo like this. So it's time to either shit or get off the pot. So she tells Mark that by the new year, which remember it's October at this point. So sometime within the next two and a half months, they were going to need to decide what they were going to do. Re Julie and whatever poor SOB had married Kelly. Were they going to stay and work it out with their current partners or were they going to jump ship and start their new lives together? For real. Now to December 1998. We know that leading up to this time frame, Julie had expressed to David's teacher, Miss DeFazio, her fears that Mark might be planning to try and kill her. But what we haven't covered is the fact that Julie also shared these fears with multiple people in her personal life. She'd told her neighborhood book club, she'd told some of her other neighbors who weren't in the book club, and she also told Mark's sister, Laura, who just so happened to be one of Julie's closest friends, in addition to being her sister-in-law. Julie had become so racked with fear that she wasn't sleeping, she wasn't eating practically anything from within her home because she was worried it might be poisoned. I mean, this stress was taking a serious toll on Julie's mental, physical, and emotional well-being, which is completely understandable. I can't even begin to imagine what it must have been like to be so afraid of someone who had such full and easy access to her. Julie was always on edge. She was always anxious. She had lost a ton of weight. She was just really going through it. And eventually on Tuesday, December 1st, it just all got to be too much for Julie to bear. She couldn't take it anymore. So she made an appointment to go in and see her primary care physician, Dr. Richard Borman. During this appointment, Dr. Borman noted that Julie appeared to be miserable and depressed as she spoke to him about her marital problems. She told him about her affair. She told him that she felt like 
her marriage was falling apart. And she mentioned to him several times that she was terrified of losing her children in the event of a divorce. Now, she did indicate to Dr. Borman that she had not been subject to any violence, physical, emotional, or financial at the hands of her husband. However, it was clear to him just from the nature of their conversation and from how Julie was presenting to him that things in the Jensen house were not going well. Even so, Dr. Borman indicated in his notes from their December 1st visit that Julie was not suicidal, nor was she homicidal. But unfortunately, beyond that, given that the appointment was only 15 minutes, Julie and Dr. Borman didn't really get to dive much deeper into what was going on. Instead, as the appointment ended, he strongly urged her to reach out to a mental health specialist for counseling, but to tide her over, he also provided her with a few samples of Paxil, which if you don't know, Paxil is a select serotonin reuptake inhibitor or SSRI, often used to treat depression, anxiety, OCD, or PMDD. And Julie was very clearly suffering from some level of depression, so Dr. Borman, gave her these pills and suggested that the two of them follow up in about two weeks. That is, unless of course she needed to speak to him sooner. And something that really stuck out to me was that one of the main takeaways that Dr. Borman seemed to remember from his appointment with Julie was that she was adamant that she was not crazy and that she did not want to be labeled or thought of as such. She did not want her mental health to become like a form of ammo that Mark could potentially use against her to take David and Douglas from her. And I know I've said it a thousand times, but the turmoil that this woman was going through, like it's hard to even wrap your head around. Anyways, so Julie leaves her appointment with Dr. Borman. She goes home, she takes her Paxil and that's pretty much it. But then, the next day, which would have been Wednesday, December 2nd, 1998, Dr. Borman receives an unexpected visit from Mr. Jensen. No call, no appointment. He just waltzed into the office off the street to share his concerns for Julie with the good doctor, you know, because he's such a concerned and loving husband. So you see, Julie simply had not been feeling herself that morning. She even had to miss her standing weekly date to volunteer in David's class. And Mark's hypothesis was that Julie seemed to be experiencing some negative side effects from the Paxil. Oh yeah, Dr. Jensen? Is that your, uh, is that your medical opinion? Sorry, but this guy really just... Basically, Mark told Dr. Borman that Julie was having trouble sleeping and he was wondering what, if anything, could be done to help her. So Dr. Borman wrote out an Ambien prescription for Julie and he gave it to Mark to get it filled. And he also reiterated that Julie should be seen again soon by either he or a mental health professional. Oh, and he gave Mark some dosage tips to hopefully help Julie build up her tolerance to the Paxil. And then he sent him on his way, sent him home to go and care for his sick wife. And that, my friends, brings us to Thursday, December 3rd, 1998. Julie Jensen woke up that morning feeling significantly worse than she had the previous day. She was disoriented, she was struggling to breathe, and she was just generally in a lot of pain. Like she could barely even get out of bed. But even so, she did still make a point to get up briefly so that she could hug her boys and tell them that she loved them before Mark took them off to school. But it was obvious to the whole family that Julie was not doing well, no matter how much she tried to mask it for her kids' sake. Little David, who mind you was in third grade at this point, so he was what, eight, nine? Even he had the wherewithal to be like, uh, yo, mom doesn't look so good. Like, think maybe we should call somebody? But Mark assured his son that Julie was fine and that if by chance she wasn't feeling better when they got home from work and school, that then he would take her in to get her checked out. So fast forward to the end of the school slash work day. Mark clocks out, he heads to the boys' schools to pick them up, and then the three of them head home to, you know, see how mom's doing. They walk in the house. Mark tells David and Douglas to wait in the living room while he goes in the bedroom to check on Julie. I guess he wanted to gauge her status before he let two rambunctious little boys run in and dogpile her. But a few minutes later, when Mark emerged from he and Julie's bedroom, it wasn't to invite the boys in to greet their mother. Instead, Mark had emerged sobbing to inform these two little boys, eight and three years old at the time, that their mother, the woman who'd loved them unconditionally and dedicated her entire life to them, was dead. Yeah, so while you digest that, I'm going to take my break, 
throw on my lashes. And when we get back, the investigation into what on earth happened to Julie Jensen begins. Don't go nowhere. All right. So devastatingly, Julie has been discovered unresponsive by Mark. She is clearly no longer alive. So he calls police, as one should. And from there, the following hours were just a blur of sirens and flashing lights and police. Neighbors gathered outside of the Jensen house as word spread like wildfire that Julie, a seemingly healthy 40-year-old woman, had suddenly died with little to no explanation as to why. And even more puzzling to lookers on was that Julie's husband, Mark Jensen, seemed to have little to no emotion surrounding the unimaginable tragedy that his family had just experienced. Now, if you've been here with me for a while, you already know what I'm going to say, that you can't judge someone based on their affect following a tragedy, that everyone reacts to and processes trauma in their own individual way, and that just because someone doesn't react the way you think you'd react doesn't mean that you're right and they're wrong or vice versa. That said, if your significant other unexpectedly died, you're probably not going to be walking around talking and laughing with your neighbors like you're at a fucking block party as the coroner wheels your dead wife out of the house, right? Well, you are if you're Mark Jensen. Yeah, people were really taken aback by Mark's apparent apathy regarding his wife's untimely demise. And his, let's call it inappropriate behavior, continued well past just his neighborhood mingling on the day that Julie died. Loved ones of Julie's also recall Mark at her funeral, standing just feet away from her casket, laughing and joking with his friends. Again, just nonchalantly behaving as if he was at some kind of potluck dinner party. Seriously, it it's sick. It's classless. It's disrespectful. It's churlish. You are at the funeral of, at the very least, the mother of your children. And you can't even feign emotion for 45 minutes, you insolent oaf. Not that I should be surprised though, considering he had the unmitigated gall to ask one of his coworkers their thoughts on him potentially bringing Kelly to Julie's funeral. You cannot make this stuff up, folks. Obviously, the coworker was like, yeah, bro, I think probably not would be best. And ugh, bless this coworker, he dealt with a lot of weird shit over his time knowing Mark. <laughs> like one time that he found a notebook of Mark's and it was just completely filled to the brim with drawings that Mark had done of dicks. No, I'm not kidding. Ooh, you know, maybe he was the secret inspiration behind Seth's dick drawing obsession in Superbad. <laughs> Anyways, as if all of that stuff wasn't bad enough, Mark also deliberately went against Julie's wishes of being buried in a burial plot next to some of her family. And instead, he had her remains cremated, which in my opinion is one, disrespectful, and two, suspicious. And as far as I was able to find, no one really knows exactly what Mark did with her remains. The last Julie's family was told, Mark had taken David to Lake Michigan and they'd sprinkled her remains there, but honestly, who's to say? And then, on top of all of that other stuff, Mark wasted absolutely no time in sweeping through the house, gathering up everything that had belonged to Julie, bagging it up, and dropping it at the curb. I mean, tell me that you couldn't care less that this woman is dead without telling me that you couldn't care less that this woman is dead. But oh, Jessica, maybe it was just too painful for him to be surrounded by all of her things. God, I hope nobody actually believes that, but if you do, um, I see your sorry but ludicrous argument and I raise you some pretty compelling information. Kelly Labonte, she's back and just a few weeks after Julie died, Mark moved her in with him. Yep, as soon as he possibly could, he moved his mistress into the home that he'd established with his late wife so that the two of them could now play house with her children. Sick. Thankfully though, her friends and family were not the only people that thought Julie's death seemed incredibly suspicious. Police were also not buying that she had died from natural causes or an allergic reaction or whatever it was that they were supposed to be believing. And for very good reason, they were side-eyeing Mark, but 
We'll get into that momentarily. The problem with this suspicion though was that the autopsy that was performed on Julie's body the day after she died was inconclusive. The pathologist that conducted the autopsy, Dr. Michael Shambliss, was unable to determine an exact cause of death for Julie. So before they really let Mark know that they thought he was to blame for his wife's death, they started trying to build as solid of a case as they possibly could against him. Luckily, Mark had given detectives permission to not only search the entire house, but also to seize whatever evidence they thought might be necessary to conduct an adequate investigation. And among those items happened to be Mark's computer. And to really put into perspective the infancy of computers at this time, this was the first computer that this department had ever seized for an investigation. So they probably didn't even have the slightest clue as to the gold mine of evidence that lay within that 10 gigabyte hard drive. Yeah, 10 gigabytes for the whole computer. The 90s were wild. That is like 3% of the storage capability that's available on a standard computer nowadays. Shit, that's less than 8% of what's available on the lowest capacity iPhone. It is seriously crazy how far technology has advanced in just like the last 30 years or so. Anyways, when they started dissecting the past activity on the Jensen's computer, they stumbled across uh, some pretty incriminating Google searches. They also found some suggestive email correspondence between Mark and Kelly. And I actually think that's how they found out that Mark had been having his own affair. But the search results were what really got the ball rolling in building a case against Mark. And normally I would take this opportunity to really tear into and make fun of whoever had made these searches. Because today we know that nothing you do on a device is ever truly gone. So if this case was more current and someone made these searches, I would certainly be like, wow, how stupid could you be as to think that no one was ever going to see this stuff? But in this case, I'll give Mark or whoever made the searches a bit of a pass. No one in 1998 could have possibly known just how deep a digital footprint could go. That said, here are the Google searches that were found buried in the internet search history of the Jensen's computer. Oh, also I keep saying Google, I'm just using that as a generic term for search engine. I think some of the searches were done through Yahoo or whatever, but regardless of the host site, the searches were as follows. On October 15th, 1998 at 6.07 PM, Someone in the Jensen home visited a site entitled Botulism in Low Acid Canned Foods. On October 16th, 1998 at 4.10 p.m., someone in the Jensen home visited a site regarding mercury fulminate, which is a primary explosive used in the fabrication of detonators. Also on November 9th, 1998 at 6 p.m., someone in the Jensen home visited a site entitled Toxicology. And also on November 9th at 6.40 p.m., someone in the Jensen home visited a site entitled Physician Assisted Suicide. On November 29th, 1998 at 5.21 a.m., someone in the Jensen home visited a site entitled www.sierrantifreeze.com. On December 2nd, 1998 at 6.23 a.m., someone in the Jensen home visited a site entitled Ethylene Glycol, which described in great detail the effects and stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. Then 13 minutes later at 6.36 a.m., another site devoted to the subject of ethylene glycol and its toxic effects was accessed. Then much later that night, At 10.47 p.m., someone in the Jensen home visited a site entitled Antifreeze Poisoning. This was huge for the investigation because if Julie had been poisoned with antifreeze, that could explain why her autopsy didn't reveal any conclusive cause of death. Because while, yes, ethylene glycol, which is the harmful component of antifreeze, breaks down into oxalic and glycolic acid, which are detectable post-mortem, you have to know that you need to be looking for ethylene glycol specifically because testing for ethylene glycol is not part of a standard autopsy. So obviously now they know that 
they got to backtrack. They got to go back and they have to see if they can find any indication that she was in fact poisoned. And wouldn't you know it, following the necessary forensic toxicology testing, it was determined that ethylene glycol was present in Julie's blood, urine, and gastric contents. So from my understanding, what they interpreted those findings to mean was that, and please bear with me here for I am not a forensic toxicologist, but I believe they determined that Julie had ingested at least two doses of ethylene glycol. Crystals in some of her tissues were indicative of the first dose having taken place at least 12 hours prior to her death, and the large concentration of ethylene glycol found in her gastric contents was indicative of acute ingestion, basically suggesting that she had had a dose in very close proximity time-wise to her death. Following this development, Mark was brought into the Pleasant Prairie Police Department for a chat. This was in April of 1999. And <laughs> y'all, this man thought for sure he was going to waltz in there and clear things up. Yeah, he had every intention of going in there and floating the theory that, you know, perhaps maybe Julie had killed herself. Little did he know that the Pleasant Prairie investigators had a whole ass other ace up their sleeve, which yes, I promise we are getting to. So they bring Mark in. It's nothing crazy at first. Everything seems fairly routine. And then they hit him with some emails between him and Kelly, which he tried to write off as them just being friends. But my guy, you were talking about one her cheeks on your desk. So either you are way closer with your friends than the average Joe, or y'all banging. So he's having an affair. They've got that much established. Check. Then from his relationship with Kelly, they segue into Julie's affair and the subsequent harassment she endured with like the dirty pictures and whatnot. And they asked him point blank if he was responsible because like really no other explanation makes that much sense. But you know, <laughs> bless his heart. Mark tried, he really tried it. He tried to tell them that someone else had left the pictures and that he didn't know who it was, but that sometimes he would gather them up and he would save them. And then he would leave them around at a later date for Julie to find, which... What? What are you talking about? Man, you know your back is against a wall when you start spewing that kind of ridiculous, just molten hot verbal diarrhea. Even so, I think at this point, Mark still thought that he had the upper hand. That is until Detective Paul Ratzberg presented Mark with a letter. A letter that had been hand delivered to the Pleasant Prairie Police Department by the Jensen's neighbor, Ted, less than 24 hours after Julie Jensen had died. A letter that Ted had been holding on to for just under two weeks. A letter that had been written on November 21st, 1998. A letter that had been penned by none other than Julie Jensen. And this letter read, quote, Pleasant Prairie Police Department, Ron Cosman or Detective Ratzberg. I took this picture and I am writing this on Saturday, November 21st, 1998 at 7 a.m. This list was in my husband's business daily planner, not meant for me to see. I don't know what it means, but if anything happens to me, he would be my first suspect. Our relationship has deteriorated to the polite superficial. I know he's never forgiven me for the brief affair I had with that creep seven years ago. Mark lives for work and the kids. He's an avid surfer of the internet. Anyway, I do not smoke or drink. My mother was an alcoholic, so I limit my drinking to one or two a week. Mark wants me to drink more with him in the evenings. I don't. I would never take my life because of my kids. They are everything to me. I regularly take Tylenol and multivitamins, occasionally take over-the-counter stuff for colds, Zantac or Imodium, have one prescription for migraine tablets, which Mark uses more than I. I pray I'm wrong and nothing happens, but I am suspicious of Mark's suspicious behaviors and fear for my early demise. However, I will not leave David and Douglas, my life's greatest love, accomplishment, and wish. My three Ds, Daddy, David, and Douglas. Signed, Julie C. Jensen. <laughs> yup, Julie had written that letter because she was terrified of her husband. She wrote that letter, she sealed it in an envelope, she gave it to her neighbor, and she told him that if anything were to happen to her, 
that he needed to get it to the police. And y'all, it is so vindicating to see Mark read this letter, to see before your very eyes his arrogant, cocky, smug demeanor dissipate as he turns into a modest, scared, just dazed little shell of a man. But even with the letter and everything they'd uncovered so far, and the almost hilariously palpable tension that swelled in the interview room as Mark read the letter, he still proclaimed his innocence. And ultimately, he was allowed to leave the station that day. Even though they were so sure that they had their man, the prosecution wanted to wait until they had every one of their little ducks in a row so that they could make sure that their case was as ironclad as humanly possible. And they worked diligently to do so for the next three years. Yeah. And all this time, Mark was just living his life out in the world as a free man. He and Kelly even got engaged. Isn't that sweet? Well, Bob Jamboyce did not think so. Oh, he's the prosecutor, by the way. I don't think that I've clarified that yet, but you've got to know who he is because he's the best. And when he found out that Mark and Kelly had gotten engaged, he started to feel a lot of pressure to pull the trigger and arrest Mark. He was really worried that given the opportunity to do so, that Mark very well could kill again. And he was just not willing to let that happen. So finally, in 2002, Mark Jensen was arrested and charged with the first degree intentional homicide of his former wife. Woohoo! He's arrested, he's off the streets, hashtag justice, right? Wrong. Because he was arrested on a $500,000 bond, which he turned right around paid and was released pending his trial. Yeah, he was in and out of there so fast, he blew papers off the intake desk. And once again, he got to frolic about around Kenosha as a free man. He and Kelly got married, he started a construction business, they had another kid. Like he was really run around town talking about what murder charge. It is so annoying. And thanks to a slew of pretrial motions and evidentiary motions and law stuff, Mark Jensen seemingly didn't face any real consequences for literally murdering his wife until almost 10 years later. Let me set the scene for you. It's 2007. Apple has just announced the upcoming release of their first ever iPhone. Tumblr debuts. Anna Nicole Smith passes away. Britney's having a pretty rough year. And Rihanna releases her popular little ditty, Umbrella. And while all of this is going on, pre-trial hearings begin in the case against Mark Jensen. The prosecution is going through the motions. They're checking all their boxes. They're talking to all the people that were in Mark's life around the time of Julie's death. And all of a sudden, purely by happenstance, one of Mark's former co-workers points them in the direction of another one of Mark's former co-workers, a man named Ed Klug. Apparently, that first guy thought that Ed would be worth talking to because he distinctly remembered one morning after a conference all three of the men were attending, the first coworker, Ed and Mark. Apparently, Ed had made some passing remark to the first guy that he was tired because he and Mark had been up all night planning on how they were going to kill their wives. And apparently, no one thought this was weird at the time because I guess, you know, <laughs> boys will be boys. But now that they were sitting there talking about the potential of Mark having murdered his wife, I don't know, it seemed like it might be important now. So they call up Ed and he told them in great detail all about the lengthy conversation he and Mark had had that night back in the fall of 1998. Like I said, they were away at a conference and after the business part of the day had concluded, he and Mark kicked back at a bar and they decided to bond over booze and apparently their shared resentment for their wives. It started with them just sharing petty grievances as I'm sure we all do from time to time. I'll tell you right here, right now, me and my best friend do it. and. To an extent, I'm sure that it's healthy to air those tiny little annoyances out to someone impartial. Otherwise, you and your spouse are just gonna be fighting over like every little thing. But I can tell you for sure that normal people don't typically take it to the degree that these gentlemen took it to. Yes, they may have started out speaking generally at first, joking about how nice it must be to be single and to not be constantly inhibited by the old ball and chain or whatever. Distasteful, sure, but illegal or incriminating, no. However, the more they talked, the more Mark must have started to trust Ed and to think that he too was serious. Because he gradually started opening up 
more and more, telling Ed about all of the research that he'd done and about the websites that he'd visited that were basically catered to men that wanted to, like, their wives. He told him that there were all kinds of undetectable poisons that he could choose from to um, get the job done. And I think he even specifically talked about visiting howtokillyourwife.com, which I swear to God was one of the web searches from the Melanie McGuire case. And I mean, that doesn't matter at all here other than to say that I feel like these cases are always somehow connected to one another. Anyways, back to Mark and Ed. Um, I really don't think that Ed thought much of this conversation and I definitely don't think that he took it seriously. Obviously, he didn't if he was popping off at the mouth about it the next day to other people. But when Julie turned up dead, uh, Ed definitely started to feel some type of way about the conversation he'd had with Mark. And the more he thought about it, the more it freaked him out. Because if Mark really did murder his wife, who knows what else he could be capable of? What if... Ed talked and Mark found out and he decided to retaliate by harming Ed or his family. So he decided that he was going to keep his mouth shut, which in hindsight, he stated that he deeply regrets. But regret or not, he can't change it. So what are you going to do? The important thing is he's there now. He's relaying his experience to the prosecution and the judge right in front of Mark. And upon hearing this, Judge Bruce Schroeder and yes, before you ask, it is the same Bruce Schroeder from the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. But back in 2007, when he heard Ed's story, he decided that, you know what, a $500,000 bond was too good for someone like Mark. So he upped it to $1.2 million, which this time Mark was not able to pay. So finally, in August of 2007, almost nine years after he killed his wife, Mark Jensen was taken into custody. And y'all, I want to say hallelujah so bad. I really do. But we are still not done. Yeah, this case is a real up and down, back and forth, fucking whirly twirly of an emotional roller coaster. Mark was finally tried for Julie's murder in early 2008. And ooh boy, did the jury hear from damn near a fleet of witnesses. They heard from Ed Klug, they heard from Miss DeFazio, they heard from Dr. Borman, they heard from Perry Tarika, they heard from Julie herself in the form of her letter, and they heard from not one, but two jailhouse informants that had served some time with Mark leading up to his trial. One, David Thompson, who allegedly Mark had tried to hire to get Ed Klug killed. And one, Aaron Dillard, who allegedly Mark had confessed to, supposedly admitting that, well, yes, he had poisoned Julie with antifreeze, that he'd actually ended up having to smother her that day when he'd gotten home with the boys because she just wouldn't die. The defense tried to tear these witnesses apart, claiming that they were receiving personal benefits from the prosecution for their testimony, which admittedly is always kind of a raised issue with jailhouse informants. However, the bigger issue they had undoubtedly was the admission of Julie's posthumous accusations in her letter. The defense had fought their tiny little hearts out to keep that letter from being admitted into trial. And conversely, the prosecution had fought their little heinies off to get it in. Ultimately, the prosecution was successful. So the defense tailored their argument to say that basically Julie had taken her own life and that because she was bitter and manipulative, apparently, this letter was her effort to frame Mark from the grave. Now, if I'm being honest, if someone ever did manage to pull that off, that would be outrageous. The amount of planning and sheer luck that would have to go in to that working is wild. Obviously, the prosecution scoffed at this theory. They felt as though, given Julie's years of documented fear of Mark, as well as the forensic toxicology reporting, that the defense was truly just grasping at straws, suggesting that Julie had taken her own life and that Mark was innocent. And one of the big arguments that they used to dismantle the defense's argument was that no antifreeze was found in the Jensen's home. So if Julie had killed herself by poisoning herself, how would she have then gotten rid of the evidence while 
also being too weak to leave her bed. Not to mention that as Julie was actively dying, there's evidence that someone in the Jensen home was double checking the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. And it's believed that Julie would have been far too incapacitated to have been prancing around the house googling her symptoms. Rather, it's believed that she wasn't dying as fast as Mark had anticipated, so he was double checking his references to see just how much longer he'd have to wait. Because if you'll remember, he told David that if Julie wasn't better by the time they got home that afternoon, that he would take her to get help. And clearly that wasn't something he was actually planning to do, which is why it would make sense that he ended up resorting to suffocating her when he got home with the boys and realized that she was still clinging to life. Closing arguments wrapped up on, I believe, either Friday, February 16th or Monday, February 18th before the jurors were excused for deliberation. They deliberated for three days before they returned to court with a verdict. And on Thursday, February 21st, 2008, Mark Jensen was found guilty of the first degree intentional homicide of his late wife, Julie Jensen. Upon hearing the verdict, Mark hung his head in disappointment because, I don't know, I guess he really thought he was going to get away with it, but he didn't. And he was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole by Judge Schroeder for his, quote, enormous, monstrous, and unspeakably cruel crime. Now, immediately following his sentencing, Mark and his defense team were already talking about their appeals and their quest to seek vindication. And that's no surprise. We hear about this all the time, right? They always say they're going to appeal and more often than not, they do try to. But what I feel like we don't hear about much is when these efforts actually pay off for them. <laughs> oh yeah. Mark and his team fought and fought and fought. And eventually in 2021, a Kenosha County judge vacated his conviction after the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that Mark really did deserve a new trial. Any guesses why? I'll give you a minute. All right, time's up. Did you guess Julie's letter? If so, kudos to you. You're correct. It was ultimately decided that the decision to allow Julie's letter into Mark's trial as evidence had gone against his Sixth Amendment right, which guarantees every American the right to a speedy trial, the right to an impartial jury, the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusations against them, the right to counsel, and the big one here, the right to confront your accuser. The nature of Julie's letter made her Mark's accuser, and given that she was no longer with us, Mark was not given the right to confront her. Therefore, his right had been violated, and he would indeed be granted a new trial. And this time, the prosecution would have to prove their case without Julie's now infamous letter. And this second trial actually kicked off January 11th of this year, 2023. And aside from the letter, it was basically a carbon copy of his 2008 trial, right down to most of the same witnesses and even some of the same prosecution team. It lasted about three weeks before the jurors were excused for deliberation. And this time, the jury only deliberated for six hours before returning with a verdict. And on February 1st, 2023, nearly a quarter of a century after Julie's death, a second jury found Mark David Jensen guilty of the first degree intentional homicide of Julie Jensen. Oh, it was so cute. After the verdict was announced and court was like clearing up, you could see Bob Jamboyce and the other prosecutor from Mark's first trial, Angelina Gabriel, hugging each other. It was just so wholesome, especially after, okay, I know it's mean and I know I shouldn't, but the maniacal laughter that like exercised itself from the depths of my very soul when I heard the verdict, it, it was otherworldly. I have exercised the demons. <laughs> and Mark was actually sentenced yesterday to the day that I'm filming, April 14th. He was sentenced once again to life in prison without the possibility of parole, thank God. Because let me tell you, after the victim statements and the prosecution and defense arguments, when the judge started speaking, at first it seemed like he might grant him the opportunity for parole. He was talking about all of his accomplishments and acknowledging how he'd been a model inmate. And I'm not gonna lie to you, 
I was sweating. But then the scales very much tipped when he started talking about how cruel and calculated and selfish Mark had been in what he'd done to Julie. And he also kind of scolded Mark for trying to use his kids being without their parents as a reason that he should be eligible for parole, as if he wasn't directly to blame for his children's lack of parents. Oh my god. And the judge was also apparently very bothered by Mark's co-worker's testimony about the dick drawings. And then all the penis pictures. I mean, that was rather strange. Like, I understand that the subject matter here is not even remotely funny, but when he brought those up out of literally nowhere, I have to admit, I cracked. Like, it for real made me laugh. But the important thing is that ultimately he decided that what Mark did was just too cruel to ever warrant the chance at a life outside of prison. So hopefully he is permanently in prison where he belongs for the absolutely heinous, prolonged, torturous way that he murdered such a seemingly sweet, kind-hearted woman. However, Bob Jamboyce did say after the second guilty verdict was handed down that on the off chance Mark manages to get any more appeals through, that he doesn't care how old he gets. He will come back and he will, quote, try the son of a bitch again unquote. Honestly, that's the kind of energy I'm here for. No, seriously, I'm really sad that he wasn't able to be at the sentencing on Friday because he has been fighting this fight for like 25 years. But nevertheless, I'm sure that he is very pleased with the outcome. As for everyone else, um, Kelly divorced Mark following his first conviction. And from my understanding, she actually continued to raise David and Douglas along with she and Mark's child, even after the divorce. From what I was able to gather, it seems like David supports his father and it kind of seems like he always has, which makes me really sad. I hate situations like this where one parent takes the life of another parent and then ultimately the kids end up with no one. It is just so incredibly selfish and I, I hate it. Douglas, on the other hand, who was only three at the time that Julie was killed, has since gone on to reconnect with some of his family from Julie's side, which I'm sure was overwhelming and incredibly emotional for everyone involved. And yeah, guys, I think that about wraps us up for today. Rest in peace to poor Julie. Ugh, man, this case was a really sad one. It seems like she brought so much light to her family and it is just awful to think that they've had to go this long without her and that she never got to see her sons grow up and that because of the selfish actions of their father, she was all but erased from their lives for so many years. I really hope now that he's been found guilty with and without the letter that he'll just give up and accept the consequences of his actions. I mean, surely he won't, but it'd be nice if he did, if he could just let the families finally have closure and finally start to try to heal. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you have a case or a topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form that I have linked in the description box. And while you're down there, you will also find all of the details for the products I use to complete this face. If you haven't already and you'd like to go ahead and subscribe to my channel, I put out new videos every week. And if you turn on your post notifications, you'll be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys. Jerry, who the fuck is Jerry? God, I have like six crusty little eyelashes. Like, <laughs> Julie turd, turd. What the fuck am I saying? With the deli- The who? Yeah. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Fine. What? <laughs> Fresca David's. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what? <laughs>